Bernie Olson is a wireless communication consultant with almost 50 years in the communications industry. Bernie retired from Motorola with over 32 years of service. He was honored as a Radio Club of America Fellow in 2004 and received the Fred Link Award this past year in 2011. Bernie is a life member, a life senior member of IEEE and is past chair of TIA TR8.18. This morning, Bernie's going to update us on the factors which cause our coverage to change when we go to narrowband. Please welcome Bernie. First things first. Oh, okay. <laughs> Forward. Oh, okay. Very good. Well, thank you and good morning, everyone. Uh, Simulcast really kind of got started out in the West Coast because we have mountains, and mountains create all these coverage poles, and that's where a lot of the original work was done. I joined Motorola in 1969, and that's when uh, locally we were building simulcast systems in our own little uh, workbenches, getting components and trying to make it work. We've come a long way uh, since then. Uh, I'm going to briefly cover a co one of the issues that Ed asked me to talk about, which is the NTIA adjacent channel rejection issue. Apparently it's uh, causing some problems and I'll discuss that. Talk about analog simulcasting and the difference that happens when you're narrow banding. Now there's been a lot of discussion already and so I may skip over some of that stuff because I've got a large number of slides to go through. I'm going to talk about digital simulcasting and that would be for the FDMA, which people call phase one P25, and TDMA, which is sometimes referred to as phase two, but it's actually the TDMA is the official word that uh, TDMA uses to describe it. And then I'm going to demonstrate how to simulate and design a simulcast system. And finally, we'll have some questions. This is the NCR uh, issue. And NTIA apparently has been failing some of the radios to make adjacent channel rejection, P25 radios. The issue is the filtering that they're using here and here. And they're using software filters. Now, if you're using physical filters with inductors and capacitors and all that, you get a nice, smooth transition. When you go to digital, you get these oscillating results. And to get a better fit to a true filter response, you have to use a lot of taps. And so the issue from the manufacturer's side is NTIA, you need to use more taps on your filters. Also, you have to look at the uh, signal generators you're using. Uh, the spec that NTIA or uh, uh, TIA uses is uh, minus 120 dBc per hertz at an offset of 12 and a half kilohertz. Well, those uh, inexpensive signal generators don't do that. They may make that at 25, 30 kilohertz offset, but they might not make it at 12 and a half. So there are more expensive signal generators that can be used. Uh, the N uh, TIA does need to define the number of taps so that that issue will be put to bed. Now, coverage. There's a lot of variables that affect coverage. Uh, and how are you going to migrate if you're going with an existing system? So you're going to have to look at the link budget, and we'll talk about that. There's a trade-off of sensitivity and interference protection which is this adjacent channel rejection that we talked about. Now when you go to narrow band, your filters aren't as efficient for the adjacent channel and you lose adjacent channel rejection. So you need to be aware of adjacent channel interference and the quote near far problem that occurs when you get radios that are on an adjacent channel they get too close to the people that are trying to receive. The coverage area is affected by the terrain and different environmental factors, uh, the power loss exponent, and the number of sites required. Now, I've heard people use this rule of thumb as what's the site-to-site -site separation? Well, I'm going to say this over and over again, that it's not a valid way for predicting coverage because 
as you add sites, it gets more complex, and the rule of thumb just kind of goes out the window. So in TSB 88, and I'll refer to these documents over and over again because that's what I've been doing for the last uh, 15 years is involved in the development of the TSB 88 series. <clears throat> so we're up to the D version now. It just got, uh, it got approved to be published in uh, Mesa in January. The way to look at this is that we'll find that we're specifying a static threshold for a radio. We then specify a carrier to noise ratio that then allows you to calculate what the noise floor of that radio is. From that, you can then go up by a faded, oops, by a faded carrier to noise ratio to get to what signal level do you need to get to a different uh, specific audio quality. Now, there's several other factors that get thrown in, such as the efficiency of the antennas, which is primarily important for portables, uh, building losses, and you finally aggregate all those and you get to some level that's required for an acceptance test that you prove that you can have that received signal level uh, with all of these factors taken into consideration. But to design it, you need to design it for even higher than that for the log normal standard deviation. In other words, a median signal level doesn't hack it. You gotta have an additional margin in there because things are moving all over the place. And then finally, at the very top of there, you have the prediction model that you use to predict what the median signal level will be at a given location. Now here's a comparison for analog, 25 kilohertz versus 12 and a half. And the takeaway from this particular slide is that for a DAQ of three, the static sensitivities will be the same because it requires a higher carrier to noise ratio uh, when you are narrow banded. But the faded sensitivity will be different and there's an approximately a 3 dB difference. Now that's not a hard number, it's a number that varies with the IF bandwidth. And IF bandwidth is tied back into the adjacent channel rejection ratio and it becomes a little more of concern when you're narrow banded because of the loss of adjacent channel rejection because it's a narrow banded radio. Now, you've probably never seen these numbers before because these are the final numbers that were approved by the TIA for the phase two TDMA uh, radios. And the question that probably everybody's interested in is that there's going to be a loss of coverage between phase one and a phase two. And the answer that I'm going to try to talk around is that there should be relatively little difference between simulcast, uh, between a uh, FDMA and a TDMA, somewhat of a loss on the talk in direction. And you can see why that is. I'm having trouble seeing it here. But you can see this is the talk-in. Darn. Talk-in here requires 17 and a half, whereas with a regular digital, you're, boy, with a regular digital, uh, your talk-out is 15.2 dB. So there's a 2 dB difference, although uh, if you were simulcasting LSM, for example, the difference is not quite as big. So overall, there's a 6 dB consistent difference between the wide and the analog, and you buy back roughly 3 dB of that by narrowing up the IF, and in the process, though, you are going to lose some of the adjacent channel rejection. Now, I keep harping on that because it used to be with 25 kilohertz, we had you know, 80 dB adjacent channel rejection. And that was pretty good. You could get pretty close to a site and not kill the adjacent channel. Well, now we're down to 60. So we've essentially lost, in round numbers, 20 dB of adjacent channel rejection. This is a high-level view of the Synad static sensitivity between wideband and narrowband. And you can see with this that 
This is the wide band, and you get a nice high synad value. As you narrow the IF and reduce the deviation, your sensitivity for 12 dB synad uh, is a little bit lost, and you cannot get as good a high level synad. If you go to the better uh, adjacent channel rejection, you lose even a little bit more of your sensitivity and your overall audio quality. <clears throat> now this is a slide from some of the stuff that is in TSB 88 and the adjacent channel rejection ratio is equal to the adjacent channel power ratio minus the carrier to noise ratio for the static. Now I'm showing this one for one particular reason and that is this is uh, on the on this side Boy, I've got big thumbs. <clears throat> this is for a uh, 6 kilohertz wide IF against a narrow band analog. And on this side, one that's 10 kilohertz. Well, 10 kilohertz wide IF will allow you to still meet the TIA minimum standards. But you can see that you have lost over 20 dB of protection in the process. So this just kind of keeps cascading. <clears throat> now, how do you estimate the loss of coverage if you go from wide band to narrow band? And I, uh, I had an article published in uh, Public Safety <coughs> Communications Magazine about two years ago that addressed this one. And the highlights from that are, if it's terrain limited, you probably see very little to none due to the rapid loss of, uh, due to the shadowing of uh, the terrain features. So if it's gonna die because of shadow loss, you're not gonna see much difference. If you have flat terrain and it just goes on forever, then you probably see some reduction in the coverage. Now, the way you can view that loss of coverage is either a reduction in the probability of achieving the desired DAQ or a loss in DAQ throughout the total coverage area. And just a comment that I would make is that I noted in all of the presentations and uh, coverage maps and things like that, they never talked about area reliability. Uh, I have yet to be involved in a public safety system that doesn't require coverage acceptance tests to prove an area reliability as a percent of the total area. And so that uh, is something, as you get into simulcast systems, that becomes a very key feature that you have to, uh, have to take into consideration. <clears throat> so here's just kind of a high level view. If you consider my, my 3 dB is an average value, you come up here and off on this side is in the legend is power loss exponents. Well, in the land mobile radio business, unless you're really up close to the site, you're gonna find that exponent runs somewhere between three and four. So I put a circle here, and if you use three and a half, you get to about 82% of the original coverage. So that's your not terrain limited, but you're just dying because you have less signal, uh, less sensitivity. So potential solutions. Well, you can go digital rather than analog for narrow banding. Uh, digital delay spread is not as robust, but it's easier to control. Now, a lot of the people that have made presentations here are addressing that, how to control these parameters. And so uh, the stuff that Ed provides is key to trying to make an analog system uh, work as well. The sensitivity is much better than narrow analog. Now, the, the key thing that we've run into with the digital is that when people are used to analog, there's kind of some vi uh, audible clues that you're running out of range. You start to, you get the noise and the popping and things like that. Well, with digital, it kind of goes over a cliff and suddenly it doesn't work at all or you get the dolphin talk very quickly and then it's gone. So it's, digital is better at getting higher audio quality at higher signal levels. You can do it with less signal, but it pays the price at the threshold. 
course, receiver voting was talked about a lot, and the beauty of simulcast is that it almost always provides the voting capability because you got to pipe that.